Kwinganewa Lomwa, Ninda Shinzi, Mary Jane, Logan McCallum, Wak Ninonji Ai Nalahi, Shokuiki in Winnipeg. Nin Delana Pewi, Nawalotaman Wendaktakwa. So I'm here uh, to introduce you to the speaker this morning. His name is Cody Grote. And Cody is an assistant professor in the history department and the Indigenous Studies program at um, Western University in London, Ontario. Uh, he is a band member of Six Nations of the Grand River, and he's Ganya Kaha. Ganya, because your K's are G's, right? <laughs> um, he's Mohawk. And uh, he's interested in public history uh, in commemoration and preservation and stewardship of Indigenous cultural heritage um, and historic sites. And he's a heritage practitioner himself. Um, and among many other things, as, uh, including some upcoming publications that I'm really excited to read. Uh, he is the winner of the 2022 Canadian Historical Association Best Article Prize uh, with Kim Anderson. Uh, and so he is um, gaining a lot of recognition within the uh, kind of discipline, capital H history uh, world, um, but he's embedding that work in his um, in his family history and his community history as well. And so uh, he brings a lot to both worlds. And I'm really excited to introduce you to him. And um, here he is. Thanks. Hello, everyone. My name is Cody Grote, and I am not Lenape, and I'm speaking here today at a conference relating to this, but I will hopefully show you with good cause why I'm here today. The title of my presentation is called Reclaiming the Stories of Our Families, and I think a lot of us will recognize that the work we're doing is so much more than just history, so much more than culture. It's connecting ourselves with our ancestors, with the factors that shaped their lives, with the situations that led to the fact that we might not be able to speak our languages with the same uh, fluency that we would like to do. And that's really the central premise of what this presentation is gonna to cover today. To give you a brief overview of what I'm gonna be discussing, my presentation will discuss the impacts of the decisions that we make on the seven generations that come after us. And I'm gonna contextualize that a bit later in my presentation. This is gonna be reflected through the story of my own family. I'm gonna to talk to you about seven generations of groats, including Michael, William, Abraham, Samson, Edward, Stanley, and ending with my father, Bill. This will cover themes of intergenerational trauma and archival nuances and Indian residential schools and the 60s scoop and alcoholism and incarceration, as well as state definitions of indigeneity. But most importantly, it's going to cover themes of intergenerational resilience and intergenerational strength, which is too often ignored and excluded from our discussion of Indigenous histories. So I'm going to start with a little bit of context of the nation of the community that I am a member of. The Haudenosaunee Confederacy, or the Iroquois Confederacy, or Six Nations, as it might be known in English, as a society is informed by what we call the Great Law of Peace. The Great Law was brought to the Haudenosaunee homelands in a time of political and cultural turmoil, when the original instructions that were given to us through our creation story were forgotten by the citizens of the Mohawk, the Oneida, the Onondaga, the Cayuga, and the Seneca Nations. The Great Law offers guidance regarding the social, cultural, and political affairs of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. And here you have a representation of a figure named the Peacemaker who's bringing us the Great Law of Peace. The Great Law conceptualized a political system for us that we refer to as the Grand Council in English. And this Grand Council governs us as a sovereign, independent people to this day. The Grand Council consists of 49 different clan families with representation from each of the original five nations. And again, every decision that is made by the Grand Council is informed by our great law of peace. The clan families 
which each have a representative are represented by a male chief. And this position is selected by a female uh, clan mother. And this assures gender parity in our forms of governance. And again, gender parity in our forms of governance is not reflected as we know through colonial forms of governance in Canada or the United States. Now through the great law of peace, our council is responsible for considering the impact that every single decision they make has on the seven generations that come after them. And again, some of those biggest decisions include events that happened in what we know as perhaps colonial America. In 1722, we welcomed a sixth nation to our confederacy, the Tuscarora Nation. The traditional territories of the Tuscarora include what we now know as North and South Carolina. And like several indigenous nations, including those that we are all citizens of, the Tuscarora initially welcomed settlers based on a relationship of shared sovereignty. And as we heard in the opening remarks, over time, these relationships were changed by settler populations. The Tuscarora were perpetually displaced. And in that context, the Oneida nation welcomed the Tuscarora into the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. And again, when that decision was made, we consider the impact that that would have on the seven generations that succeeded us. The homelands of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy include what we now know as contemporary New York State. The Grand Council entered into peace agreements with the colonies of New York, the colony of Maryland, the colony of Virginia, based on these principles that we as the Haudenosaunee are sovereign peoples and we could share our territories with other sovereign peoples. But colonial governments continually reinterpreted these relationships and they began to perceive us, the Haudenosaunee, as their subjects and our lands as theirs for the taking. This became intensified during the American Revolution. The Grand Council initially endorsed neutrality between the two opposing settler populations, but the Haudenosaunee were compelled to rejoin our alliances with the British after military campaigns, such as the Sullivan Expedition of 1779, led by General George Washington, which destroyed entire Haudenosaunee communities. Later that year, General Frederick Haldimand stated that the Haudenosaunee Confederacy would be compensated for the loss of any of our lands if we supported the British in their military endeavors, and if the Americans were successful in the rebellion. The revolution was concluded through the Treaty of Paris in 1783. This did not include any references though to the loss of our Haudenosaunee homelands. This absence was addressed a year later through something called the Haldimand Proclamation. And we see a map here on the screen that gives us a sense of this addressing. This granted 1,050 square miles along the Grand River in contemporary Ontario to the Haudenosaunee to serve as homelands for us. A colleague of mine and a friend of mine, Dr. Susan Hill, has recognized the immense divisions among the Grand Council and the Haudenosaunee Confederacy as a result of our relocation from contemporary New York to contemporary Ontario. And my colleague Sue Hill says, in many ways, the Confederacy has spent the last two centuries or the last seven generations attempting to rectify the internal problems caused by our decision to participate in the American Revolutionary War. When making these decisions, the Grand Council was guided by the great law of peace, which told them they had to consider the impact of this relocation on the seven generations that followed them. And this brings us to the story of my father, Bill Grote, here on the screen, who died from prostate cancer in May, 2022. And of course, that's me and you can see my braces back in the day sticking out from my smile. My father was raised in London, Ontario, about 75 miles from the Six Nations of the Grand River Reserve, the federally recognized territory that is left from the Haldeman Proclamation. You'll see on the screen, this is what is left of our reservation. The red line is the lands granted to us through the Haldeman Proclamation. In many ways, and I say this because I'm going to contextualize it a bit farther, later in my presentation, but in many ways, the objectives of colonial governments to culturally and politically assimilate indigenous peoples proved successful through my father, Bill, at least for the first 70 years of his life. 
Bill was recognized by the government of Canada as a status Indian, a term which I'm going to discuss farther, as legislated through the Indian Act, a law that is still in place. He hardly knew his biological parents. He had very little awareness of what it meant to be a Ganyugahaga or Mohawk citizen and a citizen of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. But importantly, and I always get a little emotional saying lines like this, Bill was always there for us as a parent, which broke a lot of intergenerational cycles that had been in place for the six generations before him. My father began to feel stiffness in his lower back during the COVID pandemic. He lost his appetite. He was sleeping for longer periods than normal. And this intensified until February, 2021, when we went to the emergency department. Bill was diagnosed with terminal stage four prostate cancer and was told that he possibly had days left to live. There were several questions I wanted to ask him as we often think about our parents in times like this. And I recognize this might be my last chance to do so. While in the hospital, I began to record him telling stories of his childhood and he mostly discussed his foster family as he was taken from his biological parents as an infant. He discussed his years as an alcoholic and importantly, his journey to sobriety, noting that he never consumed alcohol while his children were alive. My father's health stabilized and he started cancer treatments. Bill lived for another 15 months past his initial diagnosis and he had the chance to answer several farther questions about his life. We started this research together and spent the remaining months learning about the six generations before my father, which inspired him as the seventh generation since the Haudenosaunee relocated from their homelands to what we now know as Canada. This began as a way for me to tell the story of my father, who I thought was truly exceptional. And he would likely tell you that he was extremely ordinary. But as I said, the fact that his children never doubted his care for us broke into generational cycles. And the fact that he gave me the skills necessary to be here today and tell his story and situate it in these histories proves again how exceptional he was. So now I'm gonna tell you about the many generations who led up to my father. The name of my grandmother from that first generation, almost 200 years ago, has been erased from the historical record. And this reflects broader practices within historical scholarship regarding the general erasure of women, particularly indigenous women in general. And this is based on a gender hierarchy that does not reflect Haudenosaunee society. Again, this is also reflected through the scholarship that I am doing through this project. So I've, I've really followed the male line following that last name of Grote. And it's because of those archival absences where Indigenous women have been erased. It's easier to follow a single last name over time. My grandmother, sorry, my grandfather from this first generation was named Michael Grote. And you can see on this very early map of a community that we call Burlington in Ontario, a tract of land for my ancestor, Michael Grote, in the top corner. Now, the first documentation that I have so far is a document that Michael Grote signed, and it's here on the screen, and I apologize for my language. It's called the Petition of Free Negroes, and it was signed by him in 1794. There were 19 signatories who were both formerly enslaved as well as born free, all of whom immigrated north of the contemporary border between Canada and the United States after the American Revolution. It was their hope that the colonial administrator, a man named John Graves Simcoe, would grant them a tract of land alongside each other so that they could build and grow as a society as they were already experiencing prejudice in what eventually became Canada. Now, I hesitate to refer to Michael Grote by terms such as African American, because one of the other signatories was a man named Richard Pierpoint. Richard Pierpoint was born in the kingdom of Gajaga, which is now part of Senegal in Africa. So it's possible that my ancestor from the seventh generation, Michael Grote, was similarly born in what we know now as Africa. And therefore, again, he was indigenous in his own country. So all of this indicates, of course, that Michael, my ancestor from the seventh generation, was not born into the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. His citizenship was a result of his marriage to my seventh generation grandmother, whose name has been lost to the historical record. It's evident though that she was from the Tuscarora nation, which means that her own community had experienced political upheaval in her childhood. 
It was her childhood that saw the Tuscarora welcomed into the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and it was her childhood that saw the Sullivan-Clinton raids, which destroyed entire communities. So my seventh generation grandmother, whose name is lost to the historical record, experienced great political upheaval before she relocated to what is now Canada. Her future husband, Michael, received a tract of land as a personal gift from a man named Joseph Brandt, who's very well known in the historical record. He was a citizen of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy who was English speaking, and he was very much an intermediary between the hereditary council and the English colonial officials. He had his own tract of land separate from the Haldeman Proclamation where he established his own homestead. He also gave tracts of land as personal gifts to those who he was friends with. This includes Michael Grote, my ancestor, a black man, which is very confusing and requires farther discussion and nuance because Joseph Brandt actively enslaved black community members himself. We know this from the recollections of women such as Sophia Pooley, who was enslaved by Joseph Brandt. She has written, I was stolen from my parents when I was seven. There were hardly any white people in Canada then, nothing here but Indians and wild beasts. I guess I was the first colored girl to be brought into Canada. The white men sold us at Niagara to the old Indian Brandt. Brandt's third wife, my mistress, was a barbarous creature. I have a scar on my head from a wound she gave me with a hatchet. At 12 years old, I was sold by Brandt to an Englishman for $100. But Brandt also gave a tract of land to a man named Ashahel Davis, who's listed just below my ancestor here. And Ashahel Davis was a former plantation owner in the Carolinas. So it's possible that my seventh generation ancestor, Michael Grote, was enslaved by Ashahel Davis in the Tuscarora homelands. And that's how that relationship came to be. It's going to require much further research, but it is really empowering me empowering for me to see this early Black Indigenous family that was evidently thriving in Canada in the 1790s, despite sustained discrimination. The Haudenosaunee Confederacy relocated to the Haldeman Tract in what is now Ontario in 1784. A few years later, their community was entirely surrounded by this newly conceptualized colony of Upper Canada, which was established by Great Britain. The colony began to reinterpret the relationship between themselves and the Haudenosaunee and began to reinterpret what the Haldeman Proclamation truly meant. They started to say that the lands never belonged to the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, but that they were held in trust by the British. Now, the Haudenosaunee were the subjects of the British crown. But luckily, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy was able to leverage our political position in times of conflict and demonstrate that we were sovereign peoples. This was seen through the War of 1812, and these are some military payrolls from that conflict. My sixth generation ancestor was named William Grove, and he was born around 1783. He was likely an infant when his parents relocated to contemporary Ontario, leaving their war-torn homelands behind them. Census records indicate that his wife, Emily, was born in South Carolina. William alternatively identified himself as either Tuscarora or as Black, based on the historical records that are consulted, which demonstrates his mixed-race ancestry. When he was 29 years old, the age I am now, he joined fellow citizens in the War of 1812. The Haudenosaunee were engaged in several conflicts, including the Battle of Queenston Heights, which is seen here in this painting behind me. William earned a small pension from his military service during this conflict, and he used it to establish a farm on the lands of the Haldeman Tract, which was since reinterpreted to be called Six Nations of the Grand River Reserve. Later in his life, both William, my sixth generation ancestor, and Abraham, my fifth generation ancestor, joined with other members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy to participate in something called the Upper Canadian Rebellion, which challenged colonial administration with those participating saying that colonial administrators didn't appropriately consider the perspectives of the average day citizen. Haudenosaunee veterans from the War of 1812, such as William, outlined eight conditions for their participation in the rebellion, 
including the fact that they wanted non-Indigenous squatters removed from the reserve and that they wanted sustained pensions to support them in a changing economy. After the Upper Canadian Rebellion, when it was perceived that the United States was no longer going to be a political enemy of the British, there was, quote, a radical dismantling of the Indigenous imperial framework. From the Upper Canadian Rebellion onwards, we were no longer seen as military allies. That was not required anymore. So therefore, the colonial government fully perceived the Haudenosaunee as its subjects. Indian agents were appointed to be senior civil servants on reservations, and the intent of these Indian agents was to, quote, civilize the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. The next, gen oh, skip ahead. the next generation of my ancestors consisted of a man named Abraham, and you see his name written on the screen here, and his wife, Sarah. Abraham fought in the Upper Canadian Rebellion, and he was only 20 years old at the time. As part of the broader efforts to, quote, civilize the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the colony of Upper Canada encouraged the arrival of missionaries. This included a man named Elder Minor of Jerseyville, who helped to organize the Oswegan Baptist Church, which is still operating to this day. The Oswegan Baptist Church was established in 1840. Records from this church indicate that my ancestor Abraham was among the first, quote, the first batch of candidates to follow Jesus in baptism in the Grand River, end quote. The year after his baptism, the colony of Upper Canada and the colony of Lower Canada were united into something called the United Province of Canada, a new colonial entity. This colonial decision once again impacted the sovereignty of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. When Abraham, my ancestor, was 39 years old, there was a piece of legislation introduced called the Act to Encourage the Gradual Civilization of Indian Tribes, passed in 1857. And this law created a new legal category called status Indians. This detrimentally also created a process called enfranchisement, whereupon, uh, whereby upon our quote civilization, we could lose our legal Indian status and in the eyes of the British government be no longer indigenous. My ancestor representing the fourth generation of the Haudenosaunee citizens since moving after the American Revolution is this man right here, Samson Groat, the first ancestor I have a picture for, also a bit of a personal favorite of mine because he had quite the storied life. Samson was born in 1850, and when he was seven years old, he became a status Indian because of this Gradual Civilization Act. When Samson was 17 years old, he witnessed the country of Canada being established in 1867. This sovereign entity of Canada has actively suppressed competing claims of sovereignty to this day, including the claims of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy that we are still a sovereign independent people. This is upheld through the Indian Act, a piece of legislation still in place to this day, which was passed in 1876. While this legislation, while the Indian Act was being debated, the federal government stated, our Indian legislation generally rests on the principle that the Aborigines are to be kept in a condition of tutelage and treated as wards or children of the state to prepare him for a higher civilization, end quote. The Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, which was released in 1996, stressed the fact that the Indian Act is in fact a law, and that's something that we have to keep in mind. It is a law that is meant to serve a specific purpose. Uh, the Royal Commission has said, from the political perspective, it raises a profound issue of one society, in this case Canada, legislating another society, the Haudenosaunee. And while Indigenous peoples have actively tried to amend this legislation, we have never been the authors of this legislation that still controls most of our lives. The same year that the federal government introduced the Indian Act, 1876, at 26 years old, Samson Grote was arrested for cattle theft and imprisoned in the maximum security Kingston Penitentiary, which we see on the screen here. And he served two years in that institution. When his incarceration is read in isolation by itself, 
It doesn't consider the lived experiences of Samson or the lived experiences of his ancestors or the colonial systems of education or suppression or the economic realities of life on Six Nations of the Grand River that inspired his decisions. And that's what I'm hoping to contextualize in his life. I also can't help but consider the timing of his incarceration the same year that the Indian Act was passed. And scholars such as Vicky Chartrand have often commented on the intersections between incarceration of Indigenous peoples and colonial social control. Samson served his two-year term in the Kingston Penitentiary, and shortly afterwards, he married a woman named Catherine Joseph. Catherine died in her late 20s, and Samson apparently raised his three children as a single father, undoubtedly with the support of others in his community. It's notable that Catherine was born on the Tuscarora Reserve in New York State, and that Samson and Catherine were also married in the United States. And again, this builds on scholarship by people such as Audra Simpson and Alan Downey, who have recognized that Haudenosaunee have always recognized our territories are on either side of the Canadian-American border, and that border doesn't truly reflect our homelands. Samson was farther questioned by the Canadian legal system in 1898 when he sold his farm to one brother-in-law and the same evening sold it to another brother-in-law, took the money and fled to Kansas. I don't know the full uh, details of that story yet, but that is why Samson is one of my favorite ancestors. Uh, and I will certainly have to dig into that a bit more. When Samson was 64 years old, he lied about his age and he enlisted in the First World War. After his first day of training, he fled, ran away from that, and was sentenced for being absent without leave. Samson later died in the Tuscarora Reserve in New York State during the 1919 influenza outbreak following the end of the war. And he remains buried there as one of the first Indigenous ancestors whose final resting place I'm definitively aware of. As I mentioned earlier, Samson's wife, Catherine, died at a young age. Their son, Henry, who was more commonly called Edward, was my ancestor from the fifth generation since relocation. In other words, he was my great-grandfather. Several decisions that he made had a direct impact on my own life. Edward was employed as a sign painter in his lifetime, which is an interesting job, but doesn't leave much in the way of archival evidence. The Six Nations of the Grand River had one of the highest per capita enlistments of any community in the First World War. Samson signed up and then ran away very quickly. Edward was another generation of mine who signed up. And the justifications for Haudenosaunee participation in the First World War are very diverse. Some perceived themselves as allies to the British Crown who are fulfilling military obligations, and some were Canadian nationalists who joined of that capacity. I think for the most part, people like my great-grandfather Edward were somewhere in between that and had diverse justifications for enlisting. What's relevant to consider, though, was that in the years before the First World War, there was severe internal division in the Six Nations of the Grand River Reserve, and it all, result, it all was based on how we were to govern ourselves. The Hereditary Council, which had governed the Haudenosaunee Confederacy since the time of the Great Law of Peace, was being negatively perceived by the government of Canada's Indian Act, which wanted to see an elected council, an elected chief, elected councillor, similar to a municipality. The conflicts regarding governance, if we were going to be governed by a hereditary council or an elected council, continued to Europe during the First World War. In August 1917, 57 soldiers from Six Nations of the Grand River Reserve signed a petition in the trenches in France prior to the Battle of Hill 70. The petition said the following, we the undersigned soldiers of the Canadian Expeditionary Force and members of the Six Nations Indians of the Grand River regret that our circumstances have made it so that we can no longer look on our hereditary council with respect and with confidence. And we therefore sign this as an agreement to do all in our power to rid our nation of this council and put in its place a government that is elected and representative of the people. My great grandfather, Edward, was a signatory of this petition in the trenches in France. A few days later, Edward was shot through his right leg and we see here GSW right leg indicating this war wound. 
ending his time in the First World War. Like other indigenous veterans, Edward faced several barriers to getting his pension as a soldier after the war. And it was within this context that Edward chose to voluntarily enfranchise, a process outlined through the Indian Act, which meant that in the eyes of the government of Canada, Edward was no longer a status Indian, Edward was no longer an Indigenous person. His father, Samson, also chose to enfranchise at the same time. Based on the paternalism in this legislation, Edward's wife, Sarah, was also automatically enfranchised. So were their three children, their daughter, Irving, their son, George, and my grandfather, Stanley. During the interwar years, Edward worked in a number of factories in a local community called Brantford, just outside of Six Nations of the Grand River. When the Second World War was declared in 1939, Edward rejoined the armed forces as a training officer. And after the war, he was admitted to Westminster Hospital in London, Ontario, which offered long-term care for veterans. Policies relating to access to information meant that I have not been able to access Edward's records from the Second World War, despite the fact that he died 61 years ago. Requests have been made to the federal government to receive these records to better understand Edward's health and well-being after the Second World War, and these requests are ongoing. I'm going to get to this woman in a moment. I ask that people don't take a picture of this slide. My grandfather, Stanley, was the sixth generation since the Haudenosaunee Confederacy chose to relocate from its homelands. Many from the international community are aware of the Indian residential school system, which the Parliament of Canada has recently recognized as an act of genocide. The premise of this system was cultural and political indoctrination of Indigenous children into settler society. The federal government was responsible for financially supporting Indian residential schools, which were then operated by religious denominations. The assimilationist ideologies and chronic underfunding perpetuated sustained abuse and disease. Scholars such as Greg Bach and Kenton Story have noted that the administrative records of the Department of Indian Affairs are very sporadic, which is reflected through the fact that there is not a comprehensive list of students who attended Indian residential schools. We know with certainty that my grandfather Stanley did attend the Mohawk Institute Residential School, just outside of the Six Nations, the Grand River Reserve, being a student there in at least 1919. Now, the federal government and something called the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation have both stated that Stanley's residential school records have been destroyed at some point in time, and they're not sure when those records were destroyed, but this was quite a common occurrence. There's only one document that exists that says that my grandfather was a student at the residential school, and that is a class attendance list, which was saved by a teacher, which has his name listed under 1919. My grandfather Stanley died in 1983 before the Indian residential school system became a part of our public discourse, meaning that extremely little is known about his attendance, and he didn't discuss this with his family. My grandfather Stanley was born in 1910, and as I mentioned, he was a student at the residential school until 1919 when he was nine years old. That was the same year that his father, Edward, voluntarily enfranchised, lost his Indian status, and was deemed no longer an Indian, which is why my grandfather was removed from the Mohawk Institute Residential School. The next year, he was a student of a local Canesville Elementary School, and the specifics of his educational journey are not clear, but I believe he dropped out in either grade nine or grade 10. Stanley and his brother George became very well-known lacrosse players in Brantford. And again, lacrosse is recognized by scholars such as Alan Downey as the creator's game, which was used by Haudenosaunee citizens to assert our political and cultural sovereignty in times of cultural assimilation. There is very little in the way of archival evidence relating to Stanley's childhood, but my efforts to learn more about his life as the sixth generation led to a rather unexpected revelation for my family and for other members of my family. 
Early in my research, I found an obituary for this woman on the screen. Her name is Gloria Conway, and she was from Buffalo, New York. Her obituary stated that she was born on the Tuscarora Indian Reservation and that her parents were Stanley Irving Grote and Mary Miracle Pembleton. She was born in 1929. I was initially hesitant to tell parts of Gloria's story, but I've decided the fact that her family listed Stanley Grote as her father in her obituary means that they had an awareness of some of these issues and that they were willing to disclose this publicly. Nobody in my immediate family, my aunts, uncles, cousins, my father, no one had ever heard of Gloria before. From what I can determine, my grandfather Stanley had a child in 1929 when he was 19 years old with Mary Miracle Pembleton, who was his first cousin, who was 15 years old. Upon her pregnancy, it seems that Mary and her parents moved from Brantford to New York State, where their daughter Gloria was born. Census records from 1930 indicate that baby Gloria's grandparents, Frank and Bertha, were presenting the baby as their own, perhaps as a result of the stigma that was associated with this event. Gloria's eventual marriage certificate here from 1949 lists her father as unknown, but her obituary clearly indicates that this was not the case, that she did know who her father was and that he was my grandfather, Stanley. Again, I think this is necessary for us to discuss and also discuss the fact that Stanley was actively trying to hide this narrative from his family. My grandmother, Sarah Miracle, is seen here on the screen. She was Ganyagahaga or Mohawk and born at Six Nations of the Grand River Reserve. Old family photos of Sarah show that her brothers and sisters would often play with the brothers and sisters of my grandfather, which makes me think that they likely grew up knowing each other. My grandmother, Sarah, who commonly went by the name Jean, had a very difficult childhood. She was considered an illegitimate child as she was born from an affair that happened when my great grandmother's husband was fighting in the First World War. Jean's biological father, nor her stepfather ever accepted her as their own. She was therefore raised by an aunt and uncle. Sarah attended the Mohawk Institute residential school, and this is one of her records here behind me. We know that she attended because of the fleeting memories that she told her children later in her life, and based on some of the records that we have access to. There are records that recognize the experiences of a girl named Sarah Miracle that we see here. But again, we're a little bit hesitant with these archival records. The year of birth is wrong, the age is wrong, the parents' names are wrong. We know that my grandmother was raised by a series of different aunts and uncles. So while we know my grandmother attended the Mohawk Institute Residential School, we're still trying to understand the nuances of the archival record. These are my grandparents, Stanley and Sarah. They were married in 1937. Their first son, Robert, was born a year after that. And a year after that, in 1939, Stanley enlisted in the Second World War. He was in Europe for the next six years. And it seems that my grandparents' relationship was highly fractured after this time apart. I first requested Stanley's military file from the government of Canada in March 2019, and I received a heavily redacted version of these records only four months ago, after a four-year delay. A request for farther information is currently being processed to get the unredacted versions of these records. But from the fragmented records that I currently have access to, it seems that Stanley either developed an addiction to alcohol while he was overseas, or that a pre-existing condition was exemplified. There were several court martials that sentenced my grandfather to military incarceration for alcohol abuse, often alongside being absent for long periods of time. And this culminated in 1945, the final year of the war, with a military trial that sentenced my grandfather to 90 days of consecutive detention in France. My father had no awareness of his father's time in the Second World War. They had a fractured relationship and Stanley refused to discuss his time overseas. Before my father died though, we found a newspaper article that reprinted a letter my grandfather Stanley, seen here as this young man on the screen, wrote to his own father 
And this mentioned that Stanley was part of the Dieppe raids in France in August 1942. And I'm going to read the newspaper article. My grandfather said, I'm all right, although I'm thankful I can swim. I swam for two hours before I was picked up. I'm the only one left alive from my section. It certainly was terrible, but that's war. When I was in France, it was a funny thing. While dodging bullets, many things about home went through my mind. When some of my pals got hit, I said to myself, here I go. All I want is another go at those Germans for some of my pals. And again, the tone of his letter doesn't really reflect the trauma that Stanley must have endured, seeing his entire military section murdered in front of him and being stuck in the ocean for hours. While I never knew Stanley, his grandchildren who did know him said that he was often very quiet, that he kept to himself, and that he spent a lot of time sleeping in his bedroom. And I can't help but wonder if he had undiagnosed depression or general difficulties with what he had experienced in the Second World War, which would have contributed to his reliance on alcohol. Stanley worked a number of odd jobs upon his return from the war. A newspaper article from 1950 shows that he was working for the railroad and that he had fallen off a rail car during a train accident, severely damaging his shoulder, leading to, leading to farther hospitalization. Between 1945 and 1950, my grandparents, Stanley and Jean, had another two children, George, who passed away two months ago, and Catherine, who died in 2021. The story of my father as the seventh generation is very complicated. My grandmother's sister died as a result of hypertension when she was 37 years old. She was survived by her husband, William Harris, a black man and their three mixed race indigenous black children. My grandmother and my grandfather were not living together at this time. After the second world war, as I said, their relationship was fractured. Therefore, my grandmother moved in with her brother-in-law. The children were all raised together. Some of the children were sent to the Mohawk Institute Residential School. My father was born on Christmas Day, 1950. Similar to Gloria Conway, the woman I spoke about a few moments ago, my father's birth certificate does not indicate his paternity. There are a number of reasons why this might have been the case. Stanley, my grandfather, had recently been deployed to Korea. He was fighting now in the Korean War. He served overseas on and off for two years in Germany, then Japan, then Korea itself. And this was including the time when my father was born. As I will farther discuss, the Children's Aid Society states with affirmative, uh, rather affirmative language that William Harris was my father's father and not Stanley Grote. But this is the only archival document that makes that claim. There are several other records that actively contest this. The children's aid case files are filled with other things that we know to be factually incorrect. So again, we have to have a bit of archival nuance when it comes to some of these documents. As I've said, my grandmother, Jean, was a survivor of the Mohawk Institute Residential School, and she likely sustained abuse at that institution. Her biological parents had disowned her. And it's hard to understand the social conditions that influenced her own life but I do know that at the time when my father was born, my grandmother was also dealing with an alcohol addiction. The information regarding her alcohol consumption, though, comes from children's aid records, which were significantly prejudiced towards her. They often describe her as a short, thick-set Indian woman with no education. So again, I try not to read those records and her reliance on alcohol with any sense of neutrality, knowing that we need to nuance these documents. And again, while I never met Jean myself, I do know from my cousins who did meet her that they knew her to be a teetotaler who never consumed alcohol. So it's possible that she did drink for a period of her life uh, in a period of immense social and personal struggle, then later was able to move on from her alliance. The first interactions between the Children's Aid Society of London and my father, then known as Billy, occurred in June 1951, when he was only six months old. My father and I first received heavily redacted versions of his Children's Aid case file in 2019. And as I said, these describe my grandmother as a short, thick-set Indian woman. And my father was described as, quote, a cute pickaninny baby who has very fine features 
but looks highly Negro. This is again probably referencing who they thought his father was, William Harris, a Black man. Children's aid records indicate that several of the children, some as old as 10 and some as young as my father, who were six months old, were left alone for a few hours on June 29th, 1951. And this instigated an on-site visit from the Children's Aid Society. The Children's Aid Society also requested the morality squad of the London Police Department to come with the social workers. William Harris was under the influence of alcohol when he returned, and my grandmother was also under the influence of alcohol when she returned. They were therefore placed on something called the interdiction list, which was controlled by the Liquor, Liquor Control Board of Ontario. The interdiction list has been nicknamed the Indian list, and its purpose was to keep certain populations from consuming alcohol. And again, I highly question the records of a Children's Aid Society. They quote my grandmother as saying, she is embarrassed of her drunkenness and her immoral situation, and quote, she would welcome any help in enforcing a change to her own behavior, end quote. The morality squad visited the home several times in July 1951, and then they found my grandmother Jean was both pregnant and intoxicated. In response to this, the Children's Aid Society removed the Grote children from the household, including my father. My grandfather Stanley was on leave from Korea during this period of time, and both the Children's Aid Society and the police questioned my grandparents about their relationship. Records indicate that my grandmother, quote, prefers Mr. Harris as her marriage to Stanley Grote has a long history of non-support, non-relief, and court cases, end quote. Shortly after this interview, my grandmother Jean was arrested for bootlegging after, purchase, sorry, after purchasing alcohol while on the prohibited list. Jean was incarcerated several times over the next several weeks due to alcohol-related offenses, and in each instance, her children, including my father, were kept in a local shelter. Support for her alcoholism was never offered, nor was any form of social support to address her living situation. Instead, she was perpetually penalized, perpetually criminalized. And things reached a climax by the end of 1951 when a court order, which you can see on the screen here, uh, made all the Grote children, including my father, Billy, temporary wards of the state. And again, the timing of this decision in 1951 is far from coincidental, as 1951 is recognized as the first year of the 60s scoop, the coordinated over-representation of Indigenous children in child welfare systems, which many recognize as a continuation of the residential school system. This is my father here on the screen. And you'll see here, he's in the middle sitting on the couch with his foster family. My father spent his entire time in the child welfare system with a single family. His foster parents were Leonard and Sarah Horst, who were both non-Indigenous and they're sitting on the couch here. They lived in the small farming community of Newberry with a population of approximately 200 people. My father was the only culturally diverse person living in Newberry in 1950, but he does not recall any form of discrimination. My father was quite adamant that both Leonard and Sarah were the greatest role models he had ever had in his life. And he often wanted me to articulate in presentations like this, that when discussing the 60s scoop, he would like me to differentiate between the system, which he recognized as assimilative and problematic, and some of the individual actors who were engaged in the system, such as Leonard and Sarah, who often did provide support and care for him throughout his entire life. Leonard and Sarah uh, Horst ended up fostering nearly 50 children for various points, uh, for various periods of time, but my father was both the first foster child and also the longest lasting foster child. And I've since been in contact with one of the biological Horst children. This man in the dark suit standing up by the couch. He was a teenager when his parents first started to foster children, including my father. And the story that he tells me of my father's childhood in foster care is vastly different from what my father remembered when he was a child. Ron Horst told me, first of all, that for days after the arrival of my father, directly from the Children's Aid Society, 
small pills were found in his bowel movements. Medication of any sorts is not referenced in my father's children's aid case file, but the case file for my father's brother, my uncle, shows that there was heavy medication of him as a child. Farther, children's aid records note that my father was returned to his biological parents when he was four years old, which is really unique for the 60s scoop, but both my father and Ron Horst contest this claim and say that my father was raised by the Horsts until he was about 10 years old. Ron has one memory though that significantly angered his otherwise very calm father. Around 1954, when my father supposedly left foster care for good, my grandfather Stanley Grote visited the Horst farmhouse in Newberry. Ron remembers the argument that took place and said it was one of the most heated arguments he had ever seen. Allegedly, my grandfather Stanley offered in straightforward terms to sell my father to the Horst children, sorry, to the Horst family to raise as their child. I will say though, that the Children's Aid Society at the exact same time, 1954, say that Stanley claimed paternity and responsibility over all the children, including my father. So again, I'm never gonna know the nuances of what actually happened, but I know that in 1954, Stanley Grote both claimed paternity of my father and allegedly at the same time may have tried to sell him to a non-Indigenous foster family. The Children's Aid Society says that they considered placing my father for full adoption, but my grandmother intervened. And in the case files, she says, Mrs. Grote is concerned about the matter because she herself had gone through a similar experience in her own life where she was rejected by her mother and brought up by an aunt because she was an illegitimate child and she does not wish any child to go through this themselves. Again, there's a lot that I'm never gonna know, but what I know with certainty was that upon, my birth, upon his birth, my father was registered as William Grove. His paternity was not stated. Children's Aid records with factual issues say that his father was not Stanley Grove. He was in foster care for several years and from 1959 onwards, there was no uncertainty in the documentary record at all that Stanley Grove was in fact his father. Legal documents, school records, records produced by the federal government, Stanley's obituary, all of this make clear that Stanley was William's father. And again, this speaks to the complexity of determining identity through archival records, a process which we are increasingly seeing weaponized when it comes to Indigenous identity. And again, it is necessary to problematize and nuance any archival document that we're consulting as we do as historians and community members. My father had a very difficult childhood in many instances, but he also recalled it with fondness. I remember one story he told me when I was a child that I used to think proved how cool and how tough my father was and how brave he was. But now I look on it with a lot of sadness after contextualizing his life. He mentioned how his own father, Stanley, had been drinking and was using his belt to beat on another one of the children. My father had just come home from a weekend with his former foster parents and he overpowered Stanley. He grabbed the belt himself and he beat his father back away from his brother. Stanley allegedly never harmed his children again when my father was around. And again, I used to think that this was a brave and cool story, but my father was only nine years old when this happened. My father grew up as a visibly colored man in the 1960s. He began smoking when he was 11 years old he joined a gang of his peers for fun, and he loved to listen to new music that was coming out. In fact, music from the 1960s went on to define his life, and he would always tell you where he was when he first heard a song or who he was going with at the time. And again, it's necessary to historicize my father as the seventh generation and remind everyone that because Stanley was enfranchised when he was nine years old, and my grandmother was automatically enfranchised upon her marriage to Stanley, my father was classified as a non-Indian at birth. So from the day he was born, he was actually never recognized as an Indigenous person, as a legal status Indian. And this wouldn't change until my father was in his 30s. While my father knew that he was Indigenous, 
He had no interest in learning any more about this. He never embraced his identity, never embraced his culture. Quite by chance, my brothers and I learned about a very significant turning point in my father's life that he never chose to disclose with us. In 1969, when my father was 19 years old, approximately this photo in the white shirt behind me, a 15-year-old girl who went to the same high school as him was sexually assaulted and murdered. My father was questioned as a suspect as they had been seen at a restaurant together a few days before. Police records that were republished in a book about this very high profile case referred to my father as a suspicious Negro. He was released without any charges, but this case is still unsolved. And I've seen several instances where true crime podcasters or bloggers, et cetera, have repeated this same language about my father and him being a quote, suspicious Negro. In fact, my sister-in-law was listening to a true crime podcast, and that's how we learned this story. As a historian, I can't help but cross-reference these events from 1969 with the fact that my father's school records indicate he dropped out of school one week later and never returned to formal education. And it's very likely that this was because of a social stigma that was directed towards him from his questioning. It's very likely, and in fact, it's almost 100% likely that one of his close friends had been killed and he spent the rest of his life being questioned regarding this. Earlier in his high school career, my father had enlisted in the Canadian Armed Forces following the patterns of the ancestors before him. Despite being 17 years old, his military service records indicate that he only had a grade eight education. From what I know of my father much later, I think that he was probably dyslexic. He probably had a mild learning disability, which was not respected when he was a child. His skin color in the military records simply says Indian. My father was never actively deployed during his time in the Canadian Armed Forces, but he often trained at military bases across the country, including Canadian Forces Base Gagetown in New Brunswick, and in Churchill, Manitoba, where he would often see polar bears. His military career was short-lived, ending in 1979, sorry, ending in 1971, despite this being a five-year appointment set to conclude in 1975. The reasons for his removal were heavily redacted by the Department of National Defense, and I could not ask my father about this before his death. His records do indicate, though, that he was honorably discharged and not dishonorably discharged, and as I will tell you shortly, I believe it might have been an alcohol-related offense. My father was quite the storyteller when we were children. So the years following his discharge from the army are a bit of a blur, a bit hard for me to piece together. He told us how he was a gold miner, he was an oil rigger, a taxi driver, a construction worker, and he had several other odd jobs across the country. He lived in Edmonton, Alberta for 10 years, and he was married twice before my mother. I have found the names of one of these women, but not the other. And both marriages lasted for less than a year. And I found these photos really interesting. I found these at my uncle's house just recently. This is my father's first wedding. And you see he had both his biological parents, Stanley and Sarah, and his foster parents, Leonard and Sarah, at this wedding. A well-known story from my father's childhood was the time that he was stabbed in the heart while saving a woman from sexual assault while he was at a bar, and he had scars all down his chest to prove this. It was only after his death that I learned his brothers and sisters and even his biological mother were at the bar when this happened. Again, this is a story that's hard to piece together. Part of the reason that these years were foggy for my dad, part of the reason why he had trouble telling us about his own life was his own addiction to alcohol. My father shared the story of his path to sobriety after his terminal cancer diagnosis in those touch and go hours when we thought he might've only had a day or two left to live. Before he rebounded, of course, for never, another several months. And I'm gonna share my father's words with you now about his addiction. I began drinking because it was fun with my friends. And this is the Billy who started drinking. I was about 14 or 15 years old, drinking and smoking. We'd go to dances, we'd be the big badasses, we'd cause some shit. And then the fun left and it became work. It became a dependence. It started getting heavy when I was 16 years old and from 16 onwards, I was considered a chronic. 
I was drunk for another 20 consecutive years until I was 36 years old, but I've been sober ever since then for longer than I ever drank for. I was in jail a few times. It was November 23rd, 1986. I was sitting there all by myself, drinking alone at home. I had a 40 ounce of vodka and a 40 ounce of gin, but I just couldn't get drunk. I just couldn't get drunk and I lost that love of alcohol. That day I broke the bottles and I haven't drank since. I began to detox, I got off the alcohol, I got off the antidepressants I was abusing and I've never looked back. My father said the way that he was able to move on from his addiction was by helping others. He was, sorry, his manager at the time knew of a rehab facility not far from where my father had grown up in foster care called Westover Treatment Center in Thamesville, Ontario. My father was one of their first successful graduates, and while there, he developed a sports and recreation program to help others with their addictions. It was through Westover a few years later that he met my mother, Karen, a non-Indigenous woman. Now, some aspects of my mother's story are still hers to tell. But my mother had been abused as a child and found solace in her own addictions to narcotics. She became friends with my father and they became pregnant with my older brother. As I've mentioned, there are aspects of my mother's story which are still hers to tell, but based on her own experiences in her childhood, she was very afraid that my father might have tried to take away the children from her. So my father did not meet my older brother immediately upon his birth, meeting him a few months later. After encouragement from my maternal grandmother, my parents reconciled and they were married a few months later. A year after that, I was born and my younger brother was born two months later. After sharing the story of his sobriety, my father shared another story that had caused him both guilt and grief. And again, this is a story he told me on what he perceived to be his deathbed. I had chronic asthma as a child and we struggled financially. My father was working for the liquor control board selling alcohol, which I imagine must have been very difficult given his path to sobriety. But my father on several instances took cash from the cash register to pay for my medication and to pay for food. He was reported to the police, fired from his job and sentenced to probation. He thought that this was the final straw that ended his marriage with my mother. I was glad that I was able to tell him before he died that I didn't think this was a story to be ashamed of, but that I thought instead it demonstrated what an exceptional parent he was. And again, I'm going to talk about this notepad in a moment. When I was a child, I'm going to skip ahead a slide. When I was a child, my mother and father were able to register me as a status Indian under the Indian Act. I ask again that this screen, uh, nobody takes photos of. This, of course, was a major shift from what had impacted my family from the fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh generations, whereby voluntary enfranchisement had made it so that none of them were legally Indians. Indigenous women, including Mary Two Acts Early, Jeanette Corbier Laval, Sandra Lovelace Nichols, garnered international attention in the late 1980s for pointing out how sex-based discrimination in the Indian Act and the enfranchisement clauses had disproportionately impacted Indigenous women who lost their status upon marrying non-Indigenous men. The entire premise of enfranchisement and losing one's Indian status was deemed discriminatory, and the Government of Canada introduced a law called Bill C-31 in 1985, allowing select individuals the opportunity to retroactively regain their Indian status or to gain this for the first time. And this was not a small change. Upwards of 114,000 Indigenous peoples gained status as a result of Bill C-31. My grandfather, Stanley, who lost his status when he was nine years old, had died before this legislative change occurred, so he never regained his status. My grandmother, Jean, who had lost her status upon her marriage to my grandfather, was able to regain hers prior to his death. My father, who was 35 years old, received his Indian status for the first time. So it wasn't until he was 35 that my father was legally Indigenous. And again, what is fascinating is that the concept of legal Indian status was introduced in a lifetime of my fourth generation ancestor, Samson. He was impacted by enfranchisement, so were his descendants. I was entitled to Indian status from birth, and I was the only generation of my family who will have this for the entirety of my life. And I say only because my children are not entitled 
to legal Indian status. There is something called uh, what we call a two marriage or a two generation cutoff. My mother's non-Indigenous, my wife is non-Indigenous. After two generations, our children are not eligible for Indian status. So again, here you see some of the complexities. I am considered a category 6-2 Indian. My father, a category 6-1-A-3 Indian. My grandmother, category 6-1-C. And my grandfather, 6-1-D. So again, we talk about Indigenous identity. The way that the federal government has conceptualized it shows that me and my ancestors are all very much different in the legal perspective. And again, this is all based on genetic determinants. Um, as I've mentioned, it's relevant to indicate that my father was initially categorized under one section because his birth certificate didn't say who his father was. There's heavy redactions in my father's Indian status records, which I have access to freedom of information requests. And it shows that at some point in time, my father was able to prove that Stanley Grote was his father and he had his uh, records amended. So here on this side of the screen, the more formal document is my own Indian status documentation that I have freedom of information from the federal government. You can see there's redactions relating to my brothers and my mother. And then this side of the screen is my father's Indian status documentation. And there's redactions because of his parents. All of this is documented through something called the Indian Register administered by the government of Canada, which is very hard to access. Uh, it's a very complicated and messy process. After my parents divorced, my father was employed as both a long haul and short haul transport truck driver. We'd visit his house on Wednesday evenings and on the weekends. Things were financially difficult for us as children, both at my mother's and my father's houses. My father left little in way of a personal archive, but one thing he kept was several small notebooks which show his weekly budget from when we were children. He found ways to pay for the necessities as well as still taking us to the movies, buying us Pokemon cards and taking us to McDonald's. Patterns relating to indigenous children and the child welfare system were replicated in my own childhood. And again, I'm gonna skip ahead several slides. The Children's Aid Society of Oxford County, the community I grew up in, was called to my home in 2006 when I was 12 years old. These records are heavily redacted, but they state there is no heat in the home and the children sleep with their dad as there is no place for other beds. There is also one line that is not redacted that simply says there is native ancestry in the bottom corner. Other instances state Father Bill Grote is native in Six Nations Band. In fact, the Children's Aid Forum for Oxford County, which is very much a Caucasian community, has a specific section to state Indian band and number, which you see uh, right here in the bottom. This is my form, Cody Grote. You see here I'm listed as native. And again, this is for parents and children when they open a new case file. So even in this fairly Caucasian community, they still have structural systems in place to track Indigenous children like me. One thing that's very frustrating for me is there's a question on this form that says, does drug or alcohol use seriously affect the abilities of the parents to care for their children? The Children's Aid Society simply stated, not known, instead of yes or no despite the fact that my father had been sober for 20 years prior to this interaction. This perpetuated the same narratives of alcoholism and Indigenous parents that led to his own removal as a child when he was six months old. And again, after this, there was no farther interactions between the Children's Aid Society, my father, and myself. While my father never reached any levels of personal wealth, he was able to increasingly support himself and his children, as I entered university, I earned my master's degree in England, and my father was able to pay for a vacation and travel to Scotland, which he had always dreamed of doing. This was a vacation that he would actively discuss with anyone who would listen, including strangers on the street. Uh, not long after this, in 2019, while I was working on my PhD, my father first heard of the 60 Scoop class action lawsuit. I will be fully transparent and say that the 60 scoop had not been formally on my own radar prior to this. But again, we started putting two and two together. My father was indigenous. He was in the foster care system. He was placed with a non-indigenous family. Despite this, I had never put two and two together 
that my father was part of this broader intergenerational system that continued to remove indigenous children in the hopes of pursuing cultural assimilation. I can reiterate this point even farther. Prior to 2019, and my father's awareness of a 60 scoop, he had never spoken about his childhood. He had never spoken about his biological parents. Before 2019, I could not have even told you what my grandparents' names were. Um, the 60 scoop class action lawsuit was fairly straightforward. To be eligible, you had to be an Indigenous person removed from their parents between 1951 and 1991, placed in a non-Indigenous foster home or up for adoption. And again, this had to be proven through documentary evidence. Therefore, my father and I submitted our first of many access to information requests, and we received his children's aid records, beginning a four-year research project that would continue well past his untimely death. If I were honest with myself, though, I would say that his diagnosis in 2021 and his death in 2022 gave me the inspiration to continue telling this story. The year that my father received his heavily redacted children's aid file, 2019, was the first year that I was offered a contract teaching position, teaching a course called the Indigenous Experience in Canada. I was honored to invite my father as a guest speaker to share his experiences in the child welfare system and to comment about accessing his records. Again, my father was a transport truck driver. He didn't have much of an education, so this was really a great opportunity for him. He rehearsed for weeks and weeks, but the moment he started speaking in front of my class, he began to cry. And this was the first time I'd ever seen him cry and he had to take several pauses. Afterwards, he told me he didn't realize how raw the memories were, were in relation to his biological parents. But he said afterwards that he had felt a weight being lifted, having had the opportunity to talk about his story. He presented twice more to groups of undergraduate students, once while in severe pain in the last months of his life prior to his cancer diagnosis. And he did this because in his opinion, his story was quote, bigger than himself. My father continued as a partner in this research for as long as he could recording interviews with me where he was slurring his words or falling asleep or using one hand to hold up the other to sign access to information forms. It was something that brought us together in the last years of his life, including the times when COVID lockdowns meant that I wasn't able to see my father because he was in the hospital uh, with his cancer diagnosis and there were screening protocols in place. A month prior to his death, my father moved into a beautiful mansion that was converted into a hospice dedicated to assuring that he would be comfortable in the final days and weeks and to make a bit of a plug for Canada. I cannot be more thankful that this was entirely free for my father because he never had much in the way of finances and being able to have one-on-one -on -one care meant that he was truly at peace. I think of the many generations before him, and I know that the way he ended his life, both physically, mentally, and culturally, was at peace with himself, which broke a very, very deep intergenerational cycle. Of course, there's still many complexities associated with his story. He once told me that he was never able to forgive his parents for the abuse that he endured, but he was comfortable ending his life with an awareness of their lives and an understanding of the factors that shaped who they were as people. He summarized this concept in a speech he gave to a human rights organization when he said the following, I was introduced to my biological parents when I was nine years old. My parents were bitter because they had no upbringing or training on how to be parents. They had no childhood themselves. I was 36 years old when we discussed the Mohawk Institute and I learned about the residential school system. They had no parenting and they had abuse throughout their childhood. So that's all they knew. How could you give us something that they didn't have themselves? They were struggling with the best they could with anger and hatred and trying to support a family when they had none of that. Because in residential schools, they never taught parenting skills. They never showed love or affection. I used to think that I didn't have any culture, but now I've learned it was taken away from me." End quote. This presentation began with a consideration of the great law of peace, which offers guidance in regards to the social, political, and cultural affairs of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. The hereditary council responsible for governing our Confederacy was instructed to consider the effects of their decisions on the seven generations that succeeded them. 
And one of their greatest decisions was at the end of the American Revolution, when the Haudenosaunee Confederacy relocated from their homelands to what we now consider Canadian territory. I think of the seven generations who have lived since then, Michael, William, Abraham, Samson, Edward, Stanley, and my father, Bill. The Canadian state and its colonial precedents repeatedly sought to define and redefine their identities as Haudenosaunee, Tuscarora, Ganyakahaga, or Canadian citizens. As I said early in this presentation, the objectives of colonial governments to culturally and politically assimilate Indigenous peoples had proven successful in many ways in that seventh generation when it came to my father, at least for the first 70 years of his life, as I said. It's an honor to continue this research in his memory and not only to write the story of my father's life, which I think can only be understood if you look at the seven generations that led to him, but also demonstrate how the great law has taught citizens of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. And again, I truly believe that my father, whether he knew it or not, considered the impact of his decisions on the generations that would come after him as shown through the ways that he broke into generational cycles and allowed his children to fully embrace their indigenous identity. Thank you.